All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, welcome once again. Uh, as you know, every Friday we have our seminar for HS2 Academy so we can help educate the public about trends in admissions. And today we actually have a wonderful opportunity to have a, a guest speak to us about Occidental University. So our guest this evening is Mr. Duan Duan She who is the Senior Assistant Dean of Admission at Occidental College. Uh, and so, you know, we really, really hope that he can help enlighten everybody about some of the trends going on, specifically as it relates to Liberal Arts College, of which Occidental is one, uh, and maybe learn more about the differences between uh, Liberal Arts Colleges like Oxy and uh, research universities or larger national universities. Uh, and maybe we can uh, learn some insights in terms of the advantages of potentially attending a Liberal Arts College, okay? Um, as usual, if you have any questions, you can feel free to go ahead and type it into the Q&A box, uh, and that way we can get to them in the order that you have. Uh, of course, you can ask questions to Mr. Shea, uh, which, who is, of course, our guest speaker for tonight. Um, but if you have general questions about admissions in general, I can maybe hop in there and maybe try one or two as well if you'd like. Or if you have any questions about HS2, I'm more than happy to answer those questions. So with that, I'd like to hand over the floor to Mr. Shea. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Patrick. Hello, everyone. My name is Duan Duan. I use he him pronouns. I'm a senior assistant dean of admission at Occidental College, as you can see through this aeroscape photo of our campus. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about, you know, mostly focusing on private higher education in the U.S., the differences between liberal arts and research universities, although some of the, you know, characteristics of research universities can be applied to state universities like use the UC system, for example. Um, hopefully we'll be able to answer some questions about the differences and widen your scope to, you know, all the different institutions that we have in the US so you can you know, plan for your college application process a little better. Um, just to start off, I've been working in the mission for a few years now. I worked at Pitzer College previously to Oxy. Um, for three years, and it's also a small school with about a thousand students. Um, at, and then I've started working at Oxy almost a year and a half ago. Um, and you know, I read about eight hundred applications a year. Which, if you're curious on how many essays that is, that's around sixteen hundred essays a year. Um, and so I've read a good amount of applications to confidently, you know, talk about what admission looks like in the US, what it looks like in California, specifically for private institutions. So the biggest differences, I think, starting on the wide scope, there are 5,000 universities and colleges in the US, if you didn't know that, it's a very large amount. We're very fixated as a society on you know the top 200 colleges and universities, but in reality, there are about 5,000 in the US. The first thing that if you're starting off on your college application process or your college search journey, the first thing you need to distinguish is between public or a private uh, university. Public universities are mainly funded by state governments. Um, private universities are often funded by federal and state governments as well, um, but they the majority of their finances or their operating costs comes from their own endowment or students' tuition fees. So those are the biggest distinguishers for public versus private. In terms of the types of private institutions, um, we have liberal arts colleges and research universities. Liberal arts colleges are unique to the US. Um, they only exist in the US, at least right now, um, at a large scale that we have right now. Um, we There's a big focus on for liberal arts colleges on a well-rounded education. So making sure that students are graduating with critical thinking and analytical thinking skills. You're going to have typically smaller campus, campuses with smaller students um, in, in each class. Um, there's an emphasis on undergraduate education. So most liberal arts colleges that you know will only offer undergraduates um, to join their campus. There's a lot more classroom discussion because of the small class sizes. So faculty will still be lecturing. They'll leak, you know, their topics and talk about their reading, and then they usually sit back and let the students kind of drive the conversation and go from there. And that's really that focus on that critical thinking, analytical thinking piece. Um, typically, there's no teaching assistance in these courses. Um, 
and you get more engagement with faculty. And most liberal arts colleges are residential campuses. So you're required to live on campus for at least three years. Um, some are required for four years to really you know, focus and, and take that idea that you know, education is not just in the classroom, but you can also take it outside of the classroom. What does that look like in that residential space? Versus research universities, which really focus on research. Um, and that's a big part of you know, their mission as a college is, or as a university is to have that research component. They're typically larger in their enrollment sizes and they have multiple colleges within the university. So when you're applying for a university, you're applying to a specific college within your university. Um, and a good example of you know, why that might be important to you is that if you're, let's say you apply for UCLA, um, and you want to do engineering and you apply to the engineering college. And then a couple, and then a year in, you realize, actually, I want to do biology instead. You have to then reapply for the biology college. So it's a very different approach versus a liberal arts college. It's one college with multiple departments within it. Um, most liberal arts stu students who come to liberal arts campuses, they are undeclared and you can, you know, take courses in all the different de departments. There is no uh, distinguishing factors between college, the, the college itself uh, versus universities where you have to go from one college to another. Um, you, research universities also have graduate students and PhD students. There's larger lecture classes. You know, they're typically bigger classes of 300 students, 500 students. They use teacher assistants to break down those courses. Um, there's a bigger focus on athletics and a smaller percentage of students live on campus. I obviously work for Labarts College. I did not go to Oxy, uh, but I also went to Labarts College as an undergraduate student. Uh, I ended up work. I've been working for two different Labarts colleges. So I obviously have a bias in terms of what I like uh, and what I prefer and what I'm looking for. Um, but it doesn't mean that Labarts colleges aren't making a big impact. The most famous Labarts college in the U.S. is Harvard College. Yeah, they're actually a Labarts college. Uh, most Labarts colleges, you know, are in you know, small towns in the U.S., they typically have less than 2,500 students enrolled, um, and there's a lot more interaction and engagement with faculty, uh, who's, you know, most of their time, they're dedicated to education and not research as their primary kind of merit in terms of their job. Smaller bar colleges, this is just a fun, fun slide that I like to add in, um, but about 9% of Fortune 500 CEOs right now have graduated from private laboratory colleges. About 23% of U.S. educated Nobel laureates are, are LaBarts graduates. 27% of U.S. presidents are LaBarts colleges graduates. Um, this avatar here for U.S. presidents looks very much like President Barack Obama, who attended Oxy, uh, Occidental College. Uh, and then about 14% of tenure Harvard Law professors are also LaBarts graduates. So where are LaBarts colleges located? They're mostly on... Uh, the East Coast, um, liberal arts colleges were the founding, you know, colleges in the U.S. And so starting in the 1700s, when they, before the U.S. was even founded, um, liberal arts colleges were kind of the staple of, you know, higher education. They were the pinnacle of higher education. And they really held on to that kind of idea of discussion and critical thinking and writing skills. Uh, but you'll see a couple kind of spread across to the West Coast as well. Um, in California, we have 11 Labarts colleges. And these are the college, Labarts colleges in California, um, as well as private universities. So you'll see that most or all Labarts colleges, are, most of Labarts colleges in California and SoCal area. Um, the most notable ones are Occidental College and the Claremont Colleges, which is a consortium of five independent colleges. I hope that was a good kind of understanding of, you know, the differences between the Bards colleges and research universities. You can, if you have questions about that, you can pop in the q and I'll be happy to kind of dive deeper into each of them, but I just wanted to kind of go through the main ideas of the Bards colleges. Now I want to talk about my institution, Occidental College. Um, it's, um, and, you know, who we are as an institution to give an example of kind of what a Bards college does and what do we do and what, what our students do from there. Um, first of all, we're located in Los Angeles, as you can see from this slide. Um, when I go back, we're actually fun facts. I love throwing fun facts. So the, 
here it's two for you. Uh, we're the second oldest institution in Southern California. We were founded before the first road was paved in LA. Um, before the first movie was shot in Hollywood, we were founded in 1887. So we've been around for the long time. Um, the longest or the oldest sports rivalry in Southern California is not USC and UCLA. It's actually Occidental College and Pomona College. Um, to understand Southern California higher education a little bit more as well, the first college that was founded was USC, the second was Oxy, and then the third was Pomona. About 30 years after we were founded, the Southern California population tripled. And so that's when USC decided to grow into the large research university that it is now to accommodate for all the students that were coming to uh, that was that were looking for higher ed in LA. That's when UCLA was born as well. Um, Oxy and Pomona, we as two liberal arts institutions, we decided to stay as liberal arts colleges in our small sizes to have that kind of classroom discussion and um, residential living experiences. So that's a education kind of history side of it to understand why we have liberal arts colleges versus research research universities. There are different education philosophies. Oxy has 2,000 students, all undergraduate students. We don't have any grad students. We have students coming from 48 states, so all but including North Dakota and West Virginia. Uh, we have about 29 countries or students from 29 countries on campus, and we have 36 languages that are spoken. Among our in first year class, but also our entire school population, uh, we have 48% students of color. So we're getting really close to the majority of students of color, which is something that we're constantly looking towards, um, you know, especially matching, trying to match Southern California's demographics of majority people of color. Uh, our first year class also include 15% first gen students, 15% international or dual citizens coming from overseas, and also 36 languages spoken. So we will maintain those amount of languages. Um, we're the only liberal arts college in Los Angeles City. And so that's something that we really focus on in terms of who we are as an institution. If you're looking at other liberal arts colleges in the US, you're mostly gonna find liberal arts colleges in suburban or rural areas. Um, that's kind of how Oxy distinguishes itself from our peers is that you know if you want to be in an urban environment, um, or if you want to stay on the West Coast, Occidental College is a choice for you because our students have the ability to kind of be on campus, have that liberal arts residential experience, but also hop on and off campus into LA um, and, and do research and do internships and all these things that kind of add to your whole education experience. This is where we're located in Eagle Rock. Um, you'll see our campus down here with our football field and it actually spans all the way across. There's a hiking trail in the back. It's a 260 acre um, campus. Um, you'll see that we're eight miles from downtown LA. Uh, and I know for Angelinos, we're like, we don't know what eight miles means. It means about a 30 minute car ride. Um, so there is a bus from on the road right here where you can walk from campus and you can take that all the way to downtown LA. It's about 30 minutes. We're also on, you know, about 30 minutes from Hollywood um, where, my video is blocking out we're about 45 minutes from the ocean uh, or 20 minutes from Universal Studio. Um, and yes, Oxy students do get discounted tickets to Universal Studios. If you're in the Anaheim, Irvine area, we're about 45 minutes to Disneyland. So that's a good kind of idea of where we are. We're sandwiched between Glendale and Pasadena. We're also located next to York Boulevard. And York Boulevard is in Highland Park, which was rated the most hip neighborhood in the whole world. And so if you have the chance to visit our campus and visit Eagle Rock and Highland Park, you'll notice that as well, walking down York Boulevard, um, all the streets are mom and pop shops, you know, um, brick and mortar stores, all the uh, signs for the stores are hand painted. And it really adds to you know the vibe of that community. It's not a college town, but that's where a lot of our students will head down, you know, for breakfast in the morning or grab a lunch with friends. Um, it's definitely a hot spot for our students to get off campus and enjoy LA for a bit. So in terms of academic rigor, um, everyone at Oxy comes undecided. So we don't expect you at 17, 18 year old to know what you wanna do with the rest of your life. And that's really the, the essence of a liberal arts education philosophy is that you've taken six to eight subjects from K to 12 so far. 
So how do you know which of the 44 academic areas of study that we offer at Oxy, for example, that you want to study in if you've never taken courses in those areas? And so we give you the opportunity to come to campus undeclared with everyone else, and you have until the end of your second year to declare a major. In terms of your academics, there's also, also a lot of flexibility. Uh, over your four years, you'll take about a third of your classes in your core curriculum, a third in your major, and then the last third is left intentionally blank. In terms of your core curriculum or core requirements, these are areas of study that we have identified as an institution that we want our students to take to get that breadth of knowledge, um, to, to expand their horizon and take courses in different areas. And so every Oxy student has to take you know, an arts class, a humanities class, a social science class, a natural science class, a quantitative reasoning course, which is a math requirement, a foreign language, for example. But we also have different other requirements, like you have to take a course that predates the 1800s. I think this is a really good example because this is how we are different from general education, for example. So if you go to the UCs, you will have general education. Or if you go to you know, a university, you'll have general education where every student has to take English 101, Math 101, Science 101, for example, whatever the university decides. In terms of core requirements, how it's different is that the example with the pre-1800s where we want our students to look at the past to consider the present and the future, it's up to you in terms of what subject you want to take to fulfill that requirement. Right? Pre-1800 is pretty broad. You can take a biology course, a politics course, a social science course, uh, environmental science, geology. As long as the subject touches upon pre-1800s, that qualifies for that core requirement. So yes, even though a third of your classes are dictated by the core requirements, it's up to you as a student in terms of what courses you actually want to take. The only two courses that every Oxford student have to take are the first year seminars. So you take one the fall semester of your first year and another one the spring semester of your first year. These first year seminars are writing intensive courses to get you from high school writing level to college level writing. So if you look at liberal arts colleges or tour liberal arts colleges, we're gonna talk about writing and classroom discussion and research a lot, um, but you don't have to fret, you know, we'll get you there. We'll have a little bit of a hands holding to get you there. These first two seminar courses are capped at 16. So in your first year, you have a really small class with you know, your, your professor where you get to really know your peers, really get to know your faculty. There's a couple dozen topics for you to choose from every year. And they're all centered around you know, what faculty are currently researching or what they're interested in. We had a course looking at uh, music migration, for example. So musical instruments, musical melodies, mu musical genres that would not have existed if we didn't have this mass global migration happening over the last 50 years or so. Um, we also had a course looking at global pandemics. So tuberculosis, HIV and AIDS, COVID-19, and how they're often politicized within our societies. If neither of those interest you, we also had a course looking at DNA and how your DNA changes once you become a vampire. So there's a lot of different ways that you can engage with the first year seminars. Um, but the main idea is there is, you know, get you to writing level for college, getting you into college and getting you ready for research and all those things and all the wonderful things that come after that. So that's your first third. The next third of courses that you take are within your major. Um, and you'll end that with a senior comprehensive project. Every Oxy student since 1931 has had to complete a senior comprehensive project. It's a year-long intensive you know, thesis. Um, it, depending on your major, it can be a research paper, a presentation, a project, a performance. Uh, one of my favorite ones is that you know, if you're a music major, um, you have to record your own album. So you fully produce and record your own album by the end of the year. And that's something that you can take to apply for grad school, apply for jobs, you know, give to your parents to say thank you for paying for my education for the last four years is what I was able to come up with. Um, but it's something that, you know, is a pinnacle to kind of your ending of your undergraduate years. And then the last third in, the, in your academic journey is left intentionally blank. And our students really love having this flexibility to do whatever they want with it. So with this last third, you can do a double major. In fact, 10% of our students do a double major. 3% uh, of our students do a self-design major. 
you can do a double minor, you can do a triple minor, um, you can study abroad for longer and take courses that are not relevant to your major or the core requirements, or you can stay on campus and take a bunch of electives that you know don't add to your core requirements or your major requirements, but are something that you want to add to your education experience um, as a lifelong learner. We also have some numbers here on the right side. Uh, we have the nine to one student to faculty ratio. All of our classes are capped at 50 and 92% of our classes are less than 30 students in it. So really, you know, small class sizes where you get to engage and know your peers. Here's our academic areas of study. Uh, and we have a QR code. We'll have a few QR codes in the slide, um, but feel free to take out your phone and, and scan them and you can learn a lot more about the academic areas of study or if there's like a specific major that you're interested in, scan the QR code and you'll be able to click on the department and learn more about it. Um, but in terms of academic areas of study, our top major right now is economics. Um, and our top five or in the range of top five are computer science, psychology, biology, and English, as well as diplomacy and world affairs, which is our international relations major. So not majors that you would typically think of when you're thinking about smaller bar arts, right? That's there. We have a wide range of academic areas that students can all partake in. Um, some of the unique majors at Oxy are the ones that are gaining a lot of, uh, you know, popularity that I always love to highlight. The first one is food studies, which is on the bottom left here. And food studies is looking at the social inequities within our food system. So, for example, food deserts is a good example of that. Um, our uh, critical theory and social justice major, it, we're the only undergraduate college that offers this as a major. Um, you'll definitely not see this in Florida. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, another good example, I mentioned music earlier. We were placed on Billboard Magazine's top 20 music programs in the whole world. And so our students just got a renovation in their music uh, recording studio. They have a million dollars worth of equipment in there. Um, and I think this is a really good example of, you know, looking at smaller arts colleges versus research university. You take that music studio and you put it in a college of uh, 2,000 students versus a university of 50,000, 100,000 students with their undergrad and graduate population. And think about the chances if you want to, you know, tap into that resource, how many people you have to compete with to tap into that resource versus at a smaller arts college where most likely it will be open to you and, you know, 10 other students who are majoring that in their senior year. Uh, marine biology is also very popular. We have our own vessel on campus and they go off to the coast of Baja, California. They do their own deep diving and marine biology research there. Uh, we have our urban and environmental policy uh, major, and that's a combination of social work, environmental studies work, politics, kind of all into one major. Um, and then we also have media arts and culture, which we call MAC. Um, and media arts and culture is our film production department. So if you're thinking about film production, you know, we're a great spot from it. We're 15 minutes from Burbank, from all the recording studios. And so that's where a lot of our students would do internships. Of course, we also offer pre-law and pre-health slash pre-med. It's not a major, but it's a track that you can be on. Um, pre-med, for example, I know a lot of students are always asking about pre-med. About 10% of our students are uh, on the pre-med track. You have a pre-med advisor that will start working with you your first year at Oxy. And in fact, this past year, um, our acceptance rate into medical school was 89%, eight to nine. The national average is 20%. And so there's a big difference, you know, applying to medical school as a liberal arts college graduate versus a research university graduate. And I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about that in a second. So I'm going to talk about undergraduate research. Um, I know I've been talking about liberal arts colleges and research universities, but just because, you know, how we're a liberal arts college does not mean that we're liberal or arts. In fact, a third of our students are STEM majors. Um, the same thing applies to research universities. Just because their name has research university in them doesn't mean that they do more research for their undergraduate population. So yes, they do more research with their graduate population, but if you really want to do research as a undergraduate student, smaller bar colleges are where it's at. 91% of our students do research before they graduate. 
Um, I talked about our marine biology department. This is the vessel. They're off the coast of Baja, California here, and they are doing their own scuba diving and their own fishing um, to collect marine biology uh, samples for their research. We have our undergraduate research center on campus. They fund 125 students to stay on campus during the summer. You develop your own thesis, you conduct your own research, and get to present at the Southern California Undergraduate Summer Research Conference. And every year, Oxy sends the most students to that conference. About 30% of the presenters are Oxy students, and that's encompassing all of Southern California. So think about all the undergraduate students in Southern California, and Oxy's having about 30% of the presenters presenting on their undergraduate research. So that's why, you know, medical schools often look favorably towards undergraduate students coming from liberal arts colleges is because our students are graduating with two research papers, three research papers under their belt already. And so once they get in medical school, they can hop into that right away. Um, and there isn't that, you know, gap or, or learning curve into medical school. We also have study abroad. That's something that we emphasize a lot. Um, about 75% of our students study abroad. Um, you mostly go your junior year. You can go for a semester. You can go for a full year. You can go for a full calendar year, um, which includes a summer term as well. We have 40 plus programs all across the world and all of your financial aid transfers. So you pay the same amount you would if you stayed on Oxy's campus and all of your credits transfer back. So you will still graduate on time. Um, you won't miss out on any of the courses. In fact, you can take courses at your study abroad location that satisfies your major requirements or your core requirements. We also have study away programs, and you'll see these two photos on the right over here. The top one is our UN program. We're the only undergraduate college that has a partnership with the United Nations, where we send 18 seniors to work at the United Nations full time. You work, you spend a semester there during your senior year, um, and you are working nine to five, Monday to Friday at the United Nations. And then in, in the evening, you'll take courses with the faculty director. Um, one of our students who was in the United Nations program, uh, his boss caught in sick. And so he ended up addressing the UN floor. And so it's definitely a very intensive program. And it's great for our students who are interested in a career in international relations because you, you know, you have that experience that you can put on your resume and apply for grad school and, you know, jumpstart your career pretty early on. On the bottom right, uh, we have campaign semester. Um, campaign semester is a uh, it happens every other year during an election cycle, and we send students off to swing states that are not their home states, and to get, get a campaign for a congressperson or for a senator. Uh, one of our tour guides uh, this past year campaigned for Stacey Abrams in Georgia, um, and it's a great, ex you know, great experience for any students who's thinking about a career in politics. There's a lot of learning to do in LA as well. And that's the biggest thing about Oxy is our location and being in LA. The bottom right corner here, you'll see our economics department. They go off to the port of LA in Long Beach every year, and they study the American trade system there. And if you didn't know, the port of LA is in charge of 70% of the import export business here in the US. And so it's very it's very important for them to you know go down there and actually see it instead of just crunching numbers on their computer and not experiencing or seeing how everything works and ties together with each other. Um, top right, NASA's Jet Propulsion Learning Lab, top physics lab in the whole world. Um, and they're 10 minutes from our campus and a group of our students will do internships there every year. And I think that's the biggest thing. Not only are our classes are able to go out into um, LA, our students are also able to go out for these internship opportunities where you take classes in the morning, early afternoon, you hop off campus to do your internship and then you can still make it back for all the residential experiences and hanging out with your friends. Um, another example, our theater class, our theater department, has a class that watches a show in LA every Friday. And then the following Monday, they invite someone from that show to come and speak with the class. If you're interested in film production, for example, uh, we just had the David, uh, the David brothers on campus um, from uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once, the directors, and they came and did a screening of their film and spoke to our students uh, because the uh, director of visual effects on that film is an Oxy graduate. Um, if you're um, more into you know, animation um, or, uh, or Pixar, for example, we had the director of Turning Red 
um, and the executive producer from the movie come and speak with the cl- our students as well. Um, and that's all through, you know, our proximity to LA and our connections with our alumni network. Totally forgot, I also wanted to mention, um, I know in California specifically, a lot of students are interested in engineering. Uh, we have a three plus two engineering program. We do three years at Oxy and then two years at Columbia. Um, it's a program that you will graduate with uh, your bachelor's in engineering um, and you know get an advanced start in your career. And so that's something that students will often consider as well when they're looking at Occidental. 